So I think I've made reference to this Cleveland and McGill study before. Ooh, I need to move my video because I'm blocking things. I'll stick myself down here. Um, so this is a very famous study in data visualization. It was by uh, William Cleveland and Robert McGill. It's called Graphical Perception, Theory, Experimentation, and Application to the Development of Graphical Methods. So you're reading some Cleveland this week, um, and he's a, a famous data visualization practitioner, but he's perhaps best known for this study. So what they did is they gave people 10 elementary tasks. So they asked people to make judgments about comparisons, and then they assessed how accurate people were about those judgments. So if you have two objects and they are positioned along a common scale, that's probably going to be the easiest for you to tell me, you know, a comparison between these two things. The next most accurate perceptual task that people were able to do is making comparisons uh, on position on non-aligned scales. So I've got my first point here, and then I've got this other scale. It's not totally aligned, but I can probably say, okay, these are both at the same point because they're both at the middle of that, um, of that non-aligned scale. Then the next uh, three things, which are kind of all at the same level of accuracy, are length. So if I have to make comparative judgments about length, um, I might be this uh, be able to do the same kind of uh, comparative judgment for length as I would be about direction, uh, different directions, or different angles. So those are all kind of um, equally good. Um, then area. It turns out people are not very good at judging areas. Uh, and they are even worse at judging volume, different volumes, or different uh, degrees of curvature. And then the last one is uh, shading or color saturation. So that's the very hardest for people to make accurate judgments about. I'm going to move my video back. This is a figure from that uh, position angle experiment. They would ask people things like, uh, which category is bigger, A or B? And if you saw the pie chart, it might be a little bit tough for you to make that assessment. Um, you know, is this angle greater than this angle? I think that I can see that B is greater, but they look perceptually pretty similar to me. Versus when I'm looking at a bar chart, you say, which is, uh, which is more A or B? Uh, it's easy for me to see that B sticks up higher than A. And similar things like, okay, which is bigger A or C? Now it's going to be really tough for me to make that comparison on the pie chart, but on the bar chart, again, I can say mm, A is taller. So this study is the reason why people who do data visualization say that you should not use pie charts, is because the Cleveland and McGill study showed that humans are better at making comparative judgments based on length, the mapping of length, versus the mapping of angle. Uh, I think there are still good reasons to use uh, pie charts, but it's good to know that this is the reasoning for not using them. So here's another uh, example from the experiment. Um, they might have position along an aligned scale, so which is longer, this bar or that bar? Uh, it's obviously this one. Um, this is also sort of position along an aligned scale, uh, and I could make that judgment. Um, when they get further apart, it's maybe a little bit tougher for me to do that. Uh, and then when they're on unaligned scales, which I think they are here, it's maybe a little bit tougher, I can still do it. Um, and then there's, there's even one more type. So um, they did lots of different variations uh, as they were doing their experiment. So that Cleveland and McGill study was in 1985. It was done on a relatively small sample size of, I believe, college students, mostly white people, mostly men. Um, and so Jeff here and Mike Bostock decided to do a crowdsourced reproduction of this study in 2010. So up here, they've reproduced Cleveland and McGill's results. Uh, these are the log errors, um, and this is position along a common scale, um, you know, unaligned scale. Uh, right next to each other, uh, you know, so all of those different um, versions that I just showed you on the previous slide, um, and here's the sort of mean error and then the error bars for each of those errors. And then they did basically the same thing. They did all those positions, they did angle, they did areas, uh, both circular and rectangular areas, either aligned or in a tree map, um, and then they have their crowdsource results. Um, and interestingly, 
Their results seemed to confirm what Cleveland and McGill had found uh, much earlier, uh, and then they were able to do this with a much larger sample size. So this gave us some confirmation that it wasn't just on that particular audience, but it works more generally. So when I say that they crowdsourced this, what I actually mean is they used Mechanical Turk, which is an Amazon product to get you a bunch of people to do a particular task. Um, just an aside on Mechanical Turk, if you've never heard of it before, um, it's this platform for paying for or providing human intelligence tasks. They call them HITS, H-I-T's. Um, and HITS are things that humans are good at, but computers are not. This gets used um, a lot in computer science research. So oftentimes in computer science research, researchers want to be able to say, you know, we want this algorithm to be able to distinguish between um, different kinds of images, but you need uh, ground truth data. So you need tagged images. And you can ask humans to do the hand tagging for you. Then you could feed that into a machine learning algorithm. I think it was Expensify that got in a little bit of trouble um, when it was revealed that they were using Mechanical Turk to do the processing of receipts. Um, so Expensify is the system where you upload a receipt and then all of the data gets sort of inputted into an expense reporting system for a company. Um, and it seemed like, oh, the computer is doing the work. But in actual fact, it was people who were getting paid very small amounts of money by uh, someone through Amazon to just say, like, enter this number into a box. These are just like a couple jokes, basically, that relate to these um, things that humans are good at, but computers are not. So this is a comic from XKCD. I think I've shown you some XKCD comics before. It says, to complete your registration, please tell us whether or not this image contains a stop sign. No or yes. Answer quickly. Our self-driving car is almost at the intersection. Um, and then it says, so much of AI is just figuring out ways to offload work onto random strangers. So this is a joke, but this is actually a lot of how those self-driving cars have learned about things like uh, road markings or stoplights is actually through CAPTCHAs. So when you have to do one of those, like select everything that contains a car or that contains a stoplight, that data is being used to train models, uh, including uh, things like self-driving cars. And then this one is maybe even more of a joke. The joke is that computers can't tell the difference between a puppy and a bagel. Um, and so you'd need a human to tell you which is which. Um, not actually true. Uh, I think computers can tell the difference between them, but it is really cute to look at pictures of puppies that look like bagels and vice versa. So that's Mechanical Turk. Researchers have found that this is a great way to find study participants. You can pay someone a very small amount of money, um, sometimes just a cent or two, sometimes a dollar, to do a task for you. So uh, what here and Bostock did here was they said, you know, look at this graph. Tell me which of these bars is longer. And maybe you just got a penny for doing that. Or if you went through and did all of the tests, you got a buck or two. Um, and so it's an easy way to get a bunch of participants uh, usually from all over the world, there's been a bunch of interesting studies about the demographics of people who do Mechanical Turk work. Some people use it as their main source of income, um, which is uh, kind of upsetting because it doesn't pay very well. Uh, but depending on where you live in the world, if you have access to a computer, it can be a nice way to get some money. So anyway, that's all an aside. But uh, here in Bostock, we're able to kind of um, confirm that what Cleveland and McGill had said in 1985 seems to still ring true. And then I saw a great talk by Di Cook, uh, who is another data visualization professional, and she did this talk in 2016, where she did a live reproduction of the McGill and Cleveland experiment. So she had people who were sitting in the talk try out, you know, which is bigger, A or B, which is bigger, A or B, which is bigger, A or B, etc. cetera. Um, and then she was able to do the data analysis live in the talk. It was like, I don't know, a 40 minute talk and show us that the same hierarchy came out from the people in the room. And Dai has a great blog post about this um, experience. Uh, I'm going to try and get a version of the survey up and running so that we can try it out and experience some of it ourselves. But again, it just confirmed that um, these principles seem to be pretty universal. Um, the only caveat that I want to give is that uh, there, there hasn't been a lot of research about how different uh, backgrounds or cultures or education levels 
impact how people perceive visualizations. Um, one exception is this paper that I love by Evan Peck and some co-authors from 2019. Um, so the paper is called Data is Personal, Attitudes and Perceptions of Data Visualization in Rural Pennsylvania. So they found people who were living out in rural areas and they did these semi-structured interviews where they asked them about different graphics and how they perceived them. Um, and I know the image is pretty small here, maybe I can zoom in a little bit, uh, but some of these um, are, you know, position along a common scale. Some of them are using, I don't know if it's area or height here with the bottles. Um, you know, maybe this is, is length along a common scale. Um, there's some, some angles here, right? And uh, people's opinions about these visualizations were different than, uh, than the things that might have come out of the Cleveland and McGill study and the ways to reproduce it down the line. So again, I think you really have to think about your audience. And even though something might not be the most ideal way to represent the data so that people can um, make the most accurate assessments, uh, it might still be the best uh, form of visualization. So I think we saw that with the handmade data visualizations, things by Mona Chalabi and others. Um, maybe it's not the most accurate possible way to uh, display the data, but it's going to engage people and they're going to find it approachable. And so then they're more likely to get something out of it.